I am so honored, Pastor, Pastor Debbie and I, so honored to have this caliber of ministers in uh, our pulpit, this pulpit. Uh, the, you know, God, God's, uh, you know, He's just sending us His best. Amen. Amen. That's just the fact. And uh, we are honored to have him here. You know, uh, I was thinking about this. You, you know, they, they, the Bible says that God, uh, well, really the people over there in the Old Testament, uh, the Bible says that, uh, I'm talking about the Shunammite woman that we were talking about the other, was that this morning, last night, whenever that was. The Bible said she made room for the man of God. We're, create, we're here tonight to create a room for uh, Dr. Roberts to flow, however God leads him to flow. And uh, we're, we're believing God for the best that God has for this service. You know, the, the Bible says God said in the church, you know, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, fivefold ministry offices. And the evangelist is one that the Lord dealt with me about five years ago. You need to start having an evangelist in your service, in, in, your, in your church. And so we've been doing that. And I'm so glad that God didn't just send uh, 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 up-and-coming uh, young whippersnapper, still green behind his ears, evangelist. <laughs> Right? You know what I'm talking about? Did you, did you talk like that when you were a kid, Dr. Roberts? That, you, we, we, we used to talk like that. Still, still uh, wet behind the ears, whipper, young whippersnapper, you know. God didn't send us one of them that we have to kind of say, well, you know, you know, that's not really the way the Word says it, you know. But God sent us His best. Praise God. And so we're so honored that he's here tonight. And, uh, you know, the Bible tells us that uh, things uh, that he things to not despise the beginning of small things. Well, how does that say that the beginning things, small things in the beginning? I believe this is just the beginning of some bigger things in this city for for I mean, I, I'm looking for uh, stretchers to be lined up back here and people hopping out of wheelchairs because the news is getting out because this is not the last time it doesn't matter what Lindsay says this is not the last time he's coming <laughs> I'm kidding she hasn't said anything but but we just want him back all the time right would you stand with me and give him a real warm welcome this evening we just want him to come and obey God amen <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 I'm 74, and my wife says I don't look a day over 73. <laughs> Trying to decide if she meant that as a compliment, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> you said I was coming back, you know, good, thank you. You know the old, the old saying, pardon? I wasn't implying anything. I know that. They say, he who speaketh short shall be invited again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, praise God. I have enjoyed being here so much. What a wonderful church. You can feel the presence of God. And did you feel what I felt when we started singing Amazing Grace? Wow. That's what I was talking about this morning. Get us old geezers, okay? <laughs> oh, it's a great song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Wow. Praise God, praise God. Woo, glory to God. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, praise you, praise you. Praise you, praise you, praise you. Praise you, praise you. I who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. 
Surely he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover me with his feathers, and under his wings shall I trust. Hallelujah. Thank God for his word, which is alive and full of power. Thank you, Father. Now, thank you, Father, for a fresh touch of the anointing. I receive it in the name of Jesus. And everybody who is in agreement said amen. amen. Now, give the Lord a shout of praise. be seated. Praise the Lord. Jesus, 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 there's just something Bow that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something about that name. Yes, there is just something about that name. The Bible says in the book of Philippians that God has given Jesus a name which is above every name named in heaven and earth. You name any name and the name of Jesus is higher. Cancer, heart disease, blood pressure, blood sugar, hypertension, arthritis, the name of Jesus is higher. You can't name a name that Jesus is not higher than. Thank God for the name of Jesus. And on the last night of his earthly life, he gathered his disciples together and he said to them, up until now, before now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive so that your joy may be full. He gave them the power of attorney to use his name. And you and I have that authority and power. And it was that name that Peter and John used when they went to the temple to pray. And they saw the man who was crippled and had been carried there since he was a child. And they said, such as we have, we give unto you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Suddenly, healing power came into his feet and into his legs. He leaped to his feet and began to worship and praise God and went into the temple with them. Now, the religious leaders got upset and they said, by whose authority, by what name have you done this great miracle? And they said, it has been done by the authority in Jesus' name. There is no greater name. There is no higher name than the name of Jesus. Can you say Jesus? And there is just something about that name. Kings and their kingdoms well, they'll all pass away. But there's just something, something about that name. name. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. 
praise God. Well, get your Bibles out tonight. <clears throat> Let's take a little Bible tour. I want to give you lots of scriptures. Get something to write on tonight. <clears throat> to serve God means you have to do and say some things that you may not fully understand at the time. Okay? I remember I was in South Africa preaching and I had tried for several months to make contact with the leadership in Zambia. Zambia is a nation in Southern Africa that used to be Northern Rhodesia when the British were in charge. It gained its independence in the 1950s. It's now known as Zambia. And uh, I had tried to reach out uh, to, the, to the leaders of the nation for a crusade there because God spoke to me and said, I'm going to send you to Zambia. But I couldn't get a hold of anyone. And I just finally resigned myself to the fact that only God could do it. So I was in South Africa preaching, and I, had a, I was asleep, and I was awakened by my, the phone next to the bed. And uh, I heard a voice on the line, and it said, is this Reverend Richard Roberts? I said, yes, it is. And, and he said, this is President Frederick Chuluba. I am the president of Zambia. Uh, God can organize things. <laughs> He said, I understand you're in South Africa. Would you be willing and able to change your schedule and come home through Lusaka, which is the capital? And I prayed about it for about five seconds. Yes. <laughs> so I and another minister traveling with me changed our air tickets, and we flew home through Zambia, through Lusaka. And uh, they put me up in the presidential uh, guest house where only a few weeks earlier Bill Clinton had slept. I slept in the same bed with, as Bill Clinton did. And when we arrived, it was 1 o'clock in the morning, and they served a seven-course meal at 1 a.m. And we went to bed afterwards, and the next morning, uh, the president called and said, would you come to, my, to my, uh, my home? They called it the White House as well. And we'll have lunch together, and then we'll talk and pray. He was a Christian and a, and a pastor, former pastor. And so we had lunch uh, with him and with his wife. And afterwards, we went into their living room and uh, got on our knees and began to pray. And during the prayer time, he said to me, Dr. Roberts, I would like to invite you to come to Zambia for a healing crusade. Yes. And that's what I'd been praying for, and that's what the Lord had laid on my heart. When all of a sudden, the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. And I said, Mr. President, the Lord has given me a word of knowledge for your wife. And at that moment, the minister who was traveling with me began to tug my coat and said, not now. Don't mess up your crusade <laughs> by giving some word. And I said, well, I have to do it. And uh, it was a very strange word. I didn't understand the word that I was giving. I said, Mrs. Chaluba, the Lord tells me that uh, after your second baby, you had a stomach problem, you were hospitalized, the doctor has, doctors have still not found out what the problem is, and you're still suffering from it today. And you're being healed now. And uh, <laughs> she began to weep, and she said, there's no way you could have known what I went through after my second baby, and what the doctor said, and I'm still not well, and I laid hands on her, and God healed her instantly. <laughs> I was willing and obedient to say something that I didn't fully understand. <clears throat> Sometimes you have to do and say some things that you don't understand at the time in order to be obedient to the Lord. I want you to write four words down. The first word is crawl. Crawl. C-R-A-W-L. Crawl. And the second word I want you to write down is the word yell. Y-E-L-L. -L. Then I want you to write the word march. Not the month, but I'm talking about marching. March. And then fourth, I want you to write the word stand. Crawl, yell, march, and stand. And there are times in our lives when these words become very appropriate to us. 
you remember that the, the woman with the issue of blood had to crawl through the crowd because of the press of the people. Everyone was bumping up against Jesus, but she said, she said with her mouth, if I can only touch the border of his garment, I know I shall be healed. Well, the rabbis teach us that in those days, Rabboni or rabbis wore a certain type of outer prayer garment. We would call it a prayer shawl. And on the base of the garment wore tassels. And the tassels represented the law of Moses, which is the word of God. And I believe what she was saying was, he doesn't have to touch me if I can just get my hands on the word of God. I will be healed. She crawled through the crowd. And she was willing to humble herself, even though it was against the law for her to be out of her home. For she had an issue of blood for 12 years and it was against the Jewish law for her. She could have been arrested and in prison because she was out of her home with an issue of blood. She crawled through. There are times when you, you have to literally get down on your hands and knees and, uh, and crawl your way through. I remember when I was a boy I know you're not too far from Roanoke, Virginia, and you reminded me of this story. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, we had a crusade in Roanoke. And uh, <clears throat> it was in the winter, and there we were not in the tent. We were in a, in, a, in a building because it was too cold for the tent. And the tent seated about four or five, or excuse me, the building seated about four or 5,000. And on the last day, it was jammed. And... Uh, uh, no one else could get in. There were crowds outside that could not get into the building. And uh, my father's custom was on the last day of the crusade, if he had not already laid hands on you, he would lay hands on everyone that had not had prayer on Sunday afternoon. And there were several thousand that he was to lay hands on that afternoon. And when the service was over, we went down the hallway to go to the car to, to go back to the hotel. And there was a little boy who was seated in a little room here off the side by himself. And uh, uh, my, my, my dad stopped and stuck his head around the corner and said, son, what are you doing in here? He said, I'm waiting for Oral Roberts. And he said, you are? Well, why are you waiting on him? Well, I'm supposed to be healed today. And he said, well, how did you get in here? He said, well, we couldn't get in the building. The crowd was too big. And my mother pushed me down on my knees and shoved me through people's legs and said, you find a place to sit and Brother Roberts will find you. He couldn't get into the main service, so he went to one of the ante rooms and sat down on a chair and waited. And my dad said, well, son, I'm Oral Roberts. He said, you are? <laughs> he said, well, Brother Roberts, I'm supposed to be healed today. <laughs> my dad said, what's your name? He said, my name is Willie, Willie Phelps. And my dad said, well, Willie, I'm, uh, I'm pretty tired. I've laid hands on several thousand people, preached here all week long. I'm pretty tired. But if you'll set your faith in an agreement with me, I'll pray over you. And they did. Amen. Willie had uh, metal braces on his legs and crutches. He couldn't walk. But his mother had bought him a new pair of shoes. And Willie had declared that the next morning, which was Monday, he was going to take off the brace and he was going to put on the new shoes and go to school. And the next morning, after she served breakfast, he said, Mama, I'm going to take them off. And he did. And put on the new shoes. Walked across the floor just as normal as any child. Went to school. The whole school, they broke up. Everyone wanted to hear the testimony. The teacher said, Willie, it must have cost a lot. Willie said, no, ma'am, it didn't cost anything. Jesus did it. Yeah. He crawled through the crowd. 
And there are times in your life when you have to humble yourself and be willing to get on your knees and hold on for what God has promised you and for the dreams and visions he's given you. Now, the second word is yell. There are times in your life when you have to yell. And that's what Bartimaeus did. He was sitting on the highway side begging. He had on his beggar's robe. In those days, you had to have a license to beg. And you had to have a certain type of outer garment so that people could recognize from a distance that you were a licensed beggar. I wish it were that way in America today. They're on about every street corner in Tulsa. I don't know what it's like here, but in Tulsa, they're everywhere. Always with a sign, always begging for money. Well, in those days, you had to have a certain type of garment that people could recognize you were licensed, you were legal as a better. We have many illegals today in our nation. And uh, someone must have told him that Jesus was passing by because when he heard that, he yelled, Son of David! Have mercy on me. It's funny. Bartimaeus might, might not have been able to see, but he knew who Jesus was. He knew he came through the line of Jesus. By the way, someone's being healed in your left ear right now. Right now, hearing is coming into a left ear. And Jesus was arrested by those words and said, bring him to me. And the people who had told him to shut up now said, oh, oh, he wants you now. But you see how fickle people can be? If they love you one minute, hate you the next. You know. And Bartimaeus did something when he yelled. He took off his beggar's robe. That robe identified him at life's lowest station. But he knew he had to take that off in order to stand in the presence and receive healing. And there's some things in our lives that we need to take off in order to get ourselves into a position to receive from the Lord. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, I want to receive my sight. And Jesus healed him. He yelled. There's a time when you yell. And Gideon told his men, and when you take off the tops of your lanterns, you yell the sword of Gideon. Hallelujah. You shout. You yell. That's what, that's what uh, Joshua and the others did around Jericho. They yelled. When our children were little, uh, we were uh, assembling Christmas presents around the tree on Christmas Eve, which is my wife's birthday. And Lindsay knew that I'm very, uh, I'm very, how, how can I say it? Ungifted in putting together toys. <laughs> she is a master at it, and I, I wouldn't know a wrench from a screw if I saw it. And she looked at me and she said, now here's what I want you to do. Go in the kitchen and start cooking. I will fix the toys. <laughs> she can't cook, I can't fix toys. So she did what she could do, I did what I could do. And I, I began cooking, and all of a sudden I heard a scream from upstairs. And I came running back around uh, to the foot of the stairs and I saw our, our youngest girl, Chloe, who was standing at the top of the stairs. She wasn't more than about this, this high. And her face was blue and she was struggling to breathe. And Lindsay began uh, to yell and to scream. And I, I quickly called our doctor and uh, our, our child uh, doctor and he said, take her to the hospital immediately. And I, I put her under my arm and, and, and took her to the car to drive as fast as I could to the hospital, which is about five miles away. And uh, Lindsay couldn't go with me because I had two other children that were in bed, asleep. So she had to stay at home and she was walking around the house yelling and yelling and yelling and yelling and yelling and screaming and crying. And all of a sudden she kicked the door. And the Lord spoke to her and said, it's all right to cry as long as your cry is for a miracle. Amen. That yell became a cry. And I was praying in tongues with that girl under my arm uh, going to the hospital. When I got there, her breathing was back to 98%. And she's fine today. She's now 33 and we call her Oral Roberts in a dress. <laughs> 
There are times in your life when you've got to yell. You've got to yell for it. And then marching. To march. I remember times in my life when uh, Lindsay would go into a store and she would see the price on the sale rack was still too high and she would begin to march around the rack <laughs> believing for the price to drop <laughs> until the storekeeper would say, Mrs. Roberts, how much do you want to pay? <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay is a sales shopper. Her shoe size is whatever is on sale. <laughs> <laughs> now we men don't understand that, but you women, you know exactly what I'm talking about. She'll wear anywhere from an, from an eight to a nine and a half <laughs> if it's on sale. <laughs> she marched. And there's a lot of marching in the Bible. Joshua and uh, the, the children of Israel marched around Jericho. God gave them a plan, march around six times, once a day. And then on the seventh day, march seven times. And the walls would fall flat. They marched. There's a time in life when you have to march and believe God. The four lepers marched against the Syrian army. They said, why sit we here until we die? Let us march for our victory. There are times when you have to get your life moving forward. You have to get your body moving forward. You have to get your feet pointed in the right direction. Marching, marching, marching. Amen. Times in my life when I've had to do that. And I'm sure there are times in your life. I remember telling uh, Brother Philip uh, today. I remember back in 1979, we were building a big hospital complex and we ran out of money. Multi, multi-million dollar project. We're totally out of money. We had to stop construction. And uh, it's an embarrassing thing to stop construction. And my dad said to me, son, let's, let's go out and let's march around the construction site. And you know, in the natural, you say, well, what will that do? Then you read the Bible, you say, well, it did a lot. <laughs> And so we went out there, it was summertime, it was hot, 100 degrees, and he and I started marching around that construction site. The building was part way up, but, uh, but we, were, we were out of money. And so uh, we, we began to march, and he and I just marched and marched and prayed in the spirit, and we marched and marched, and we finished marching, we got back in the car to go home. He said, you know, this is the week of the Hagen camp meeting in Tulsa. He said, let's go down there tonight. I said, okay. He said, pick me up about 6.30. I said, all right. And he knew Brother Hagen because they had been friends since the 1940s, the early 50s. And I'd never met him, but I had known of him. <clears throat> and so we drove down uh, to the assembly center, <clears throat> and it was packed out, about 12,000 people in the building. And we drove up, parked the car, and went inside, and uh, we were backstage. And uh, my dad said, where's Brother Hagen? And they said, well, we'll take you. So he was in a little room off the side with his wife, Aretha, and with Ken Jr. and Lynette, and several other family members were there. And we went in, and, and they embraced and shared for a few moments. And my dad introduced me to Brother Hagen, and we had a wonderful talk. And he said, can you stay for the service? And my dad said, well, that's why we're here. We're here for the service. And so he said, well, we'll tell, uh, he told one of his men, take Brother Roberts and Richard out and sit them down on the front row. So we went out and they had their worship and Brother Hagen made some announcements. And then he, he did what I, what I have now seen him do many times. He looked up and said, oh, okay. And he said, the entire offering tonight is for Brother Roberts. And my dad and I about, fall, about fell out of our chairs. We had marched all afternoon. Now someone had heard from the Lord to sow a seed. And the next morning, they brought a check for $360,000. Now, that was 1979. $360,000 then was worth $1.4 million today. It was a lot of money. And we were able to start construction again. But we marched. There are times when you gotta, you gotta march. You gotta get up and you gotta get moving. I wear a path in our carpet in our living room, marching, 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 and praying in tongues. And then there's a time when you gotta stand. Having done all to stand, therefore, the Bible says, stand. Now you don't have a right to stand if you've not done all you can do. 
God's not going to do it all for you. Without him, you cannot. But without you, he will not. There's something that you've got to do. You've got to, you've got to take a stand sometimes. You know, because if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for just about anything. There's times in life when you have to take a stand. And that's what, that's what David did when he went up to visit his brothers and brought some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And he saw Goliath, nearly 10 feet tall, saying, send a man against me. And if he defeats me, we'll be your slaves. But if I defeat him, Israel will serve us. Yeah. And they were in that valley. And the soldiers of the Israelites were paralyzed with fear. King Saul, who was taller than all of them, was paralyzed with fear. And David said, is there not a cause? I will take a stand against this giant. Yeah. And they laughed at him. His brothers mocked him. Who do you think you are? You're just a little shepherd boy out there. He said, well, I may be a shepherd boy, but when a lion came against my father's flock, I took him on. And when a bear came, I took him on and I killed them both. And the same God who delivered me from the bear and the lion will deliver me from this godless, uncircumcised Philistine. There's a time when you got to stand up and say, no, devil, no. You can't have me. You can't have my family. You can't have my finances. You can't have my health. You can't have my business. You can't have my job. You can't have my ministry. You can't have me because I belong to God. There's a time when you have to stand. And David took those five smooth stones and a slingshot because he'd practiced. The Bible says there were, was a group of young men in those days who could hit a single blade of grass with a stone from a slingshot. And David may very well have been one of them. And he went running toward the enemy. And Goliath said, am I a dog that you, you, you sir, am I a dog that you send a, this little boy after me? And David said, you come against me with your spear and with your sword, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. And I'm going to feed you to the fowls of the air. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes. And he put that stone in that socket and let it fly. And when it flew, something entered Goliath's mind that had never entered his mind before. collapsed to the ground and David not having a sword took Goliath's sword and cut his head off stuck it on a pole riding through town saying you mess with me this is what I'll do to you and it wasn't long until he was king <laughs> I'd been through a horrible experience in my life and um, <laughs> I had given up on women. <laughs> I said, never again, Lord. And a friend of mine said to me, there's a young lady in law school that I'd like you to meet. And I said, I'm just not interested. Yep. He said, she's pretty. She's got long hair and dark eyes and she's beautiful. I said, well, he said, I'd like to bring her to the service tonight where I was preaching, and I'd like you to meet her. I said, okay. And so um, I preached that night on David and Goliath and cutting off the giant's head and taking a stand for God. And at the close of the service, I had everybody stand, and I said, now tonight we're going to cut off the giant's head spiritually. Whatever you're facing, if it's debt, if it's sickness, if it's fear, if it's worry, whatever it is, we're going to cut that giant's head off tonight. And I had them take their Bibles because it is the sword of the Spirit. I had them take their Bibles and I had them cut that thing off in Jesus' name in the spirit realm. Now back in David's day, you know, could kill somebody, put their head on a pole and everybody would rejoice. Today you're going to go to prison. <laughs> you could do that back then, you know. I wish you could still do it today because <laughs> everybody here knows someone that needs to die. <laughs> now, don't look.
look at me like that. You know I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Every one of you know, you can think of them. You've got their name on your lips right now. Someone that needs to die. And you would be a willing agent. Well, why can't you get a license? You can get a license to kill a deer. <laughs> or a duck license or a fishing license. Why can't you get a people license? Just one a year, that's all I want. That'd be my quota, one a year. Every one of you knows someone that needs to die. I can think of two or three. When the service was over, my friend brought her back behind the stage and introduced me and said, this is Lindsay Salem. And uh, she was beautiful, long hair down to her back and beautiful eyes and just gorgeous. And uh, I said, hello. And she said, hello. And uh, she said, I liked your sermon. I said, you did? She said, yes. I said, what part did you like? She said, the part about cutting off the giant's head and taking a stand. I said, really? She said, yes. I said, what's your biggest giant? She said, you. <laughs> How could I be her biggest giant? I'd never met her. And I, uh, I looked at my friend and said, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, just, You know what I mean. But I, I, I couldn't understand. Curiosity got me. Three days later, I had to get her phone number. And I had to find out how in the world I could be her biggest giant. I'd never even met her before. And uh, so... Um, I called her and I said, I, I don't understand. You've got to explain to me, how could I be your biggest giant? And what does standing have to do with it? And she said, well, what you don't know is when I was 12 years old, my father, who was a Lincoln Mercury dealer in Flint, Michigan, got cancer and was in the University of Michigan hospital. And someone who worked in my dad's dealership knew someone who worked for your dad and a phone call was arranged and your father called my father on the phone and led him to the Lord and prayed for his healing. She said, my dad got saved on the phone call, but he died from the cancer. But your father was the only one that prayed. Even our own pastor said, why don't you just let him die in dignity? And she said, because of your father, that he prayed and took a stand with my father. My mother became a partner with your ministry and began sowing seeds every month and stood with you praying and believing that the day would come when God would provide the right husband for my daughter, Lindsay. And uh, I'm now here in law school and I don't have time to be with you. <laughs> She said, I'm going to be a corporate lawyer and I'm, I'm uh, heavily involved in the school and I don't have time to date. I have no desire and you're my biggest giant because I can't get you off my mind. And so I'm staying away from you. I said, well, how about dinner tomorrow night? She said, okay. <laughs> so we went to dinner and uh, I picked her up and uh, she had just run three miles and just uh, gotten, taken a shower and gotten dressed and her hair was still soaking wet when I went, went to the door. And she had it piled up on her head. And her hair was long, but she had it piled up on her head. And she said, let's go. I'm sorry I'm running late because I've been running. And so uh, we went to dinner. About halfway through the meal, I, I, I said to her, what would you say if I asked you to take your hair down? She didn't answer. She just reached up and took it down. You know? <laughs> I said, wow, <laughs> wow, this could be interesting. <laughs> 
And so after the meal, I paid the bill and got back in the car and I said, have you ever seen Lake Keystone? It's about 30 minutes outside of Tulsa. She said, no, I've just been here a few weeks in school. I said, well, let's drive out there. It was summer still, it was September and still daylight savings time, so it was still light. So we drove out to Keystone. There's a beautiful lookout place, platform out there that you can look over the entire lake. And we stood there looking at the lake, talking to one another, and she was so beautiful. I don't know what got into me, but it just, I just leaned over and kissed her. And to my surprise, she kissed me back. And 16 weeks later, we were married. <laughs> Sometimes in life, you just got to make a stand. <laughs> and I made a stand. And it's been 43 years. Thank God for women. Hallelujah. All right, get your Bibles out now. Okay, I'm, I'm now through my introduction. <laughs> oh, let me give you some things to do tonight to get into a position to, re, to receive from God, okay? And I'm gonna give you some scriptures and you may wanna write them down. I'll, well, I'll look them up in my Bible while you're, while you're writing and we'll do them together. The first thing is 10 steps now in order to receive. The first thing is to worship the Lord every morning. Amen. Worship the Lord every morning. And the scripture is over in Psalm 34 and verse one. If you have your Bibles, turn over to that Psalm 34 and verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Worship in the morning is precious. When I awaken in the morning, I begin praying in tongues. Oftentimes I'm marching around our living room, our den, I get up with the word of the Lord in my mouth, worshiping the Lord, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. There is no substitute for worshiping the Lord. It's the way to start your morning. And I put on my seven piece armor of God. No soldier would go to battle without his armor on. And yet Christians go into the world every day without their armor. I put on my helmet of salvation, my breastplate of righteousness, my belt of truth, my gospel shoes of peace, my sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, above all taking the shield of faith, by which I'm able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil, and number seven, praying in the spirit. Praying always in the spirit, Paul said. People say there are six pieces, there are seven. And the seventh is praying in tongues. Worshiping the Lord in the morning when you awaken. That's how you get directions from headquarters. The second thing is to remember to forgive. Mark eleven twenty five. Jesus said, remember to forgive. For if you, not, if you do not forgive, your Father which is in heaven will not forgive you. We all want to be forgiven. Sometimes we forget to do the forgiving. Unforgiveness, my wife would say if she were here, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Unforgiveness will do nothing to them, but it will kill you. Remember to forgive. Live a life of forgiveness. One of the great secrets of my life with all that has come against me, and I have had plenty to have come against me, is I've learned how to forgive and to let go and give those people to God. Yes. Only God can handle them. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And I asked my father what that meant. And he said, son, only God can absorb the punishment that vengeance brings. Notice when you point your finger at someone, you got three fingers pointing back at yourself. Yeah. That's number two. Number three, listen for the whistle. Listen for the whistle. Look over in John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verses 27 and 28. 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. Um, in the hundreds of years ago, in the days of the trackless deserts of Saudi Arabia, there was a certain trainer who worked with Arabian horses, and he used a whistle, and he trained the horses to obey the commands of the whistle. And uh, at the end of their training session, when he was almost ready for them to graduate from their school, he would make them go for a long period of time without water. And when he saw that the horses were not going to survive without water, he would release them to run to the water. And just before they put their muscles in the water, he would blow the whistle. And the whistle meant they had to turn around and come back to him. And the horses, when they heard the whistle, some would turn and trot back, others would bury their muzzles in the water. And the ones who came trotting back graduated. And the others went back to school. And the ones who graduated were given to the king because they were the finest horses. God has a whistle. And the whistle is the Holy Spirit. Listen to the voice of the Spirit. Listen to God. You've got two voices in the world. You've got God's voice and you have the devil's voice. And if you can't tell the difference in the voices of your best friend and your worst enemy, then you need to get saved. Listen for the whistle. Then number four, speak God's word out loud. Mark 11, 23 and 24. That's what we talked about last night. Speaking, saying. Jesus said, whoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. What you say is critically important because God created everything you can see from what you cannot see by what he said. And uh, people say, well, I, I, I don't speak much. Well, you may not speak much, but you need to speak the word of God. Yeah. 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 Of course, the Bible says you shall have whatsoever you say. And if you've not been saying the right thing, you need to repent and start saying the right thing. Yeah. Then number five, pray until the pain stops. Pray until the pain stops. Now, the scripture on that is in 1 Thessalonians. Turn over to your right to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'll begin at verse 17. Well, just, yes, uh, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Pray without ceasing. Now, that does not mean that you are in prayer all day long, but it means you are in an attitude. You're bubbling over with it so that at any given moment you can break into prayer. Okay? Prayer is the key that unlocks the throne of God's mercy. Prayer is the sincere desire of your heart. Pray until the pain stops. When our, our oldest daughter, Jordan, was little, uh, Lindsay had a car that was two-door, and you remember the kind of car that you had to push the seat forward yeah. to get into the back seat? Yeah. And she was putting Jordan in the back seat of the car in her, in her uh, child's seat. Yeah. And when she put the seat back up, uh, accidentally she closed Jordan's foot in it and smashed her foot. And Jordan began to just wail and cry. And Lindsay realized what she had done. And of course, you know, uh, she, she did everything she could do to get her foot out. And, and then and, and Jordan began to say, pray, mommy, pray, 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 mommy, pray, pray. And Lindsay began to pray. Lord, come on, keep someone on you. You just you'll go into town praying. And Jordan said, pray, mommy, pray, pray. I pray. Well, I just pray. Well, pray again. Pray, 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 mommy, pray, pray. Finally, Lindsay said, well, uh, how long do you want me to pray? She said, till the pain stops. <laughs> 
pray till the pain stops. I've been praying for one of our dear friends the past, uh, well, past couple of months, they're diagnosed with, uh, with bone cancer. And it's getting better and better and better and better. And just got a tremendous checkup, which I just heard about yesterday. And, uh, and I'm not giving up on praying. Amen. Praying, praying, praying every day. Talking to him two or three times a day. I already talked to him twice today. Probably call him again after the service tonight. Just pray until the pain stops. Just keep praying and praying. Number six, don't be a doubter. Amen. James chapter one. That's over to your right. Right after Hebrews. That's why you husbands need to make the coffee. The Bible says he brews. Amen. <laughs> oh, by the way, did you know that Isaac was the first smoker in the Bible? When he saw Rachel, he lit off a camel. <laughs> That was really bad, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, James 1, 6. James, I'm in Hebrews. Let's get over to James. James, now I'm in Peter. Where's Hebrews? Where's James? James, um, James 1, verse 6. But let him not ask in faith, I'm sorry, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. Don't be a doubter. Yeah. Believe it, receive it, doubt it, do without it. You know, you're going to live by your faith or you're going to live by your doubts. I'd rather live by my faith. Don't be a doubter. Don't have a doubter type of attitude. Don't be the kind of person who says, well, I doubt this will happen. Don't do that. Be in faith, not in doubt. Then number seven, don't just sit there, do something. Don't just sit there, do something. Get into some kind of action and just go one chapter over, verse uh, ch uh, one, of, uh, excuse me, chapter over in James, James 2, and start at verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of food, and one of you says unto them, Depart in peace, be warm. <laughs> How much is that going to help them? Uh, notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? A faith without works is dead. You can tell me you have all the faith in the world, but until you release that faith, until your faith becomes action, faith must have a corresponding action. So don't just sit there, do something. You know, they say there are three types of people in the world. People who make things happen, people who watch things happen, and people who say, what happened? Where do you fit in there? I want to make things happen. And that happens by my faith. Faith without corresponding action is worthless. Use your faith. You were born with it. You have it. Number eight, sow your seed. Your season is waiting. All right now. And the scripture, of course, is Luke 6.38. Talking to pastors, we were coming over, and I said, when do they plant corn in Iowa? He said, typically between April 15 and May 1, depending upon the weather. Yeah. And he said, there is a, uh, it's like a science, you said. There, there is a, a certain temperature that they want, the, they want the ground to be, what, an inch or two below the surface? Yeah. Uh, they want it to be 55, 56, somewhere along in there, or somewhere along in there, they, and there's a science to it. And, and, and so what I'm trying to say is the seed waits on the right season. The seed waits on the season, okay? Everybody in Iowa understands there's a time that you, you don't plant it today. We had sleep this morning, right? When he got out this morning, it was sleeting. Okay, you're not going to plant corn this, mor this morning, right? It wouldn't make it. There's a, there's a time, there, there's a season for the seed, okay? And the seed waits for the season. But in the supernatural realm, it's not like that. In the supernatural realm, your season is waiting on your seed. And what I mean by that, I mean when you sow, it becomes your season. 
to receive from the Lord. Amen. Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with what measure you give, it will be given unto you again. Number nine is wait on the Lord with expectancy. And that's over in Isaiah. Go back to your left to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And look here at verse number 31. Isaiah 40 verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk yes. and not faint. Yes, 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 yes. We have to have some patience. Yes. Holy Spirit patience. Because when a word comes, it does not always uh, come uh, and be fulfilled immediately. Now we Christians, we want everything done in a microwave style. We want to pray it and we want to receive it immediately. And when we don't get, we don't get what we want, we kick God. And we wonder what the problem is and we blame it on God. But he said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Back in the 70s, uh, I don't know if any of you, any of you remember the old uh, uh, Nashville TV show, Hee Haw? Yeah. Remember Hee Haw? Yeah. Uh, I was asked to come down and be a guest on Hee Haw. And I did two programs with uh, Roy Clark and uh, Buck Owens and all the, all the gang there, Grandpa and Lulu and the whole, whole group, they're all there. And I sang a gospel song, They That Wait Upon the Lord Shall Renew Their Strength. I sang it and, and they were humming along with me, you know. You, you got to wait on the Lord. Now, we don't like to wait. We don't like lines. Okay? We don't like lines. However... There's a time when you have to wait on the Lord. When the prophetic word came to me when I was 19 that I would be in the healing ministry, there was a waiting time because I, need to, I needed to mature. I needed to grow up. I wasn't ready. If God had put that in my hands then, I would not have known what to do with it. It didn't come for a number of years, but the good news is it came. And I think I can testify to that, and I think you know it's true because you saw it in action this morning. But there's no telling what I would have been preaching here if I was 19 years old and it happened, okay? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. And number 10, believe that nothing is too hard for God. And that's Genesis 18, verse 14. The question was asked, is there anything too hard for God? There is nothing that you're facing that God cannot handle. He has a timing for it. He has the right season for it. Don't say this is too hard even for God. Nothing is too hard for God. No matter what it is, if it's spiritual, if it's physical, if it's financial, if it's emotional, if it's a, a mental situation, if it's, it's in, your, in your family, in your marriage, in, in any area of your life or your ministry, nothing is too hard for God. Keep those 10 attitudes and get yourself in a position to receive from God Almighty. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Amen. Father, I just thank you tonight and praise you. I thank you for this wonderful church, for this opportunity to be here and to pour out my heart and share with the people what you have deposited in me. And Lord, I thank you that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are not only acceptable, but they reach out and touch people's lives in a demonstrable way. And Father, I thank you for that anointing. And I pray now a prayer of blessing over everyone here tonight. And I pray the prayer that I pray every day of my life over my family, over my wife, over my children. I want to pray it over you. This is a prayer that, that I pray, and I'll pray it over my wife in just a little while tonight when I call. I pray for the peace of God that passes all understanding to be upon you. 
I pray for the mercy of God to be yours. I pray for you to be healed, whole, and well in every area of your life. I dispatch the heavenly angels to encamp about you and to keep you safe from harm, danger, accident, injury, pilfering, theft, hijacking, and terrorism. I plead the precious shed blood of Jesus over you. I call you healed, whole, and well. I pray over you the blessing of Abraham, the mind of Christ, the spirit of David, the wisdom of Solomon, the peace of God that passes all understanding, and the joy of the Lord, which is your strength in his mighty name, that you will not dash your foot against a stone because angels are surrounding you. You didn't lose your angels just because you grew up. You still have angels around you. They are ministering spirits for you. And I call them forth in Jesus' name to encamp about you and to put a ring of protection around you in every area of your life and keep you safe in every area of your life until I see you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now somebody give a shout of praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. I've got some resources here. Uh, that's our Jeff. They don't have to get them. Sorry. They're over there on that table. Uh, one is Lindsay's book, uh, Discover Your True Worth. And one is my new book on healing. And then there is a Miracle Living series on healing the Holy Spirit and seed faith. They're available, and this will be the last night they're available, so go get them all in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Wow, there's so much there. How many of you know he could have just expounded on one of those and taken the whole service? But uh, thank God we can. How many of you know God will take those, you know, maybe one of those really jumped out at you. He'll take if you if one of those jumped out at you, just say, God, there's more to that. And you want to share with me, just sit down and meditate. Let God reveal more to you. He has so much that, you know, the word of God is pregnant with revelation. Just keeps giving forth more and more and more. Amen.